whether it was Sharon Moore or Jim Harbaugh on the sidelines against Penn State, the Michigan Wolverines were winning that matchup much closer to 10 times out of 10 than 7 or 8 times out of 10. Michigan ran from the box score a service academy type game plan. And that was after they tried to pass the ball and bring complimentary football to the table in their first two drives. But Sharon Moore, being the great innovator and elite offensive coordinator and offensive line coach that he is, decided to switch things up, decided to pivot from the original plan that Harbaugh and company and staff installed during the week, and Michigan beat the Penn State Nittany Lions 24-15. to They controlled a top-10 opponent, an opponent who I think is being underrated by the College Football Playoff Committee. Sorry, Mizzou. Sorry, Louisville. I think Penn State's better than you, but I digress. Michigan controlled Penn State. They beat them into the floor. It got Penn State fans more frustrated at James Franklin than they usually are after he loses a top-10 game. And Michigan now has won 10 or more games for the third season in a row. And for the third season in a row, the game is going to decide who goes to Indianapolis, consequentially who likely wins the Big Ten, and who will likely be a top-two seed in the Final Four team playoff. But Maryland may have other plans, because on Saturday, in the same way that Michigan clinched their third 10-win season in a row, Maryland clinched their third season in a row where they are bowl eligible. And the Maryland Terrapins have a good quarterback. They have an offensive line that looked better against Nebraska than it had in the previous four games, which were all losses. They have some talent on defense that, again, came together against a horrific offense in Nebraska. But you got to right the ship at some point. And Maryland, to their credit, did that. So Michigan has been calling themselves America's team recently. As a Michigan fan, I kind of just roll my eyes at that and say, whatever. Just win your games. I love the team. I love the staff. But win your games. Attain radio silence and just win. A lot of people are rooting for Michigan to succeed. But there are others who are rooting for their ultimate downfall. So tell me in the comments section below who you think is America's team this weekend. Is it Michigan? Is the world really behind Michigan to prove everyone wrong? Or is the world behind Maryland to shut Michigan up? Or is the world, perhaps, as Ohio State has the largest fan base in the country, does the world want Michigan to win this game and then get destroyed by Ohio State and Ann Arbor? Or get blown out by Georgia in the playoff? You tell me in the comments section below. And before we resume this preview and prediction video, please hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and click the notification bell so that you can... Get notified when I post more college football, Maryland football, Michigan football, and Big Ten football content. Comment your thoughts, your analysis, your own preview and prediction down in the comment section below. I'm fascinated to hear what you guys think, what matchups you think are important. You probably see something that I don't see. And to go back to some of my earlier comments a few seconds ago, I don't think Michigan would get blown out by George in the playoff. I have Michigan a few spots ahead of Georgia in my poll, and my power ranking system, which is not available for this week, sadly, it's taking a lot of time to automate, but it is going to be much improved for next week. I just wanted to play it safe rather than rushing out the system. My power rankings would have Michigan ahead of Georgia. FPI has Michigan ahead of Georgia. Bill Connolly's S&P Plus has Michigan ahead of Georgia. I was making that comment to not get a reaction, but to get a public poll of the feelings around Michigan. There are a lot of people that don't like Michigan, and even though there are plenty of college football fans who have a certain disdain for Georgia and don't want them to three-peat, myself included, those who aren't Michigan fans might take a satisfaction of seeing Michigan repeat the 2021 Orange Bowl to this Michigan team. Uncle Lou would definitely be one of those people, but he's a Georgia fan, so... Who cares um, in that sense, I guess. Not that who cares, but of course he would like that because he's a Georgia fan and he wants his team to be successful. But anyway, got off on a little tangent there. Michigan versus Maryland. Noon game, 
It will be on Fox. Gus Johnson, Joel Klatt, at least I think. Michigan is obviously a big favorite to win with or without Jim Harbaugh. Michigan is going to have a legal case that will be heard and received this Friday by a judge to determine whether Harbaugh can coach in these next two games against Maryland and Ohio State on the sidelines, or if Sharon Moore will still function as the interim head coach in these next two games. Regardless, and this is something that I wanted to touch on before I get into my matchup preview and really into the depth, into the meat of this matchup, of this game between the Wolverines and the Terrapins, is that I don't think whether Harbaugh is on the sidelines or not, I don't think that matters as much as many perhaps would think. I, when I was live reacting to Michigan's win over Penn State, I trotted out a statistic that Sharon Moore has more road top 10 wins than James Franklin does. And really what that was, that was, was me poking fun at James Franklin and his inability to win against top 10 opponents, especially on the road, but he's one in six at home against top 10 opponents anyway. And it was also to poke at the idea that I think Sharon Moore is a really good head coach. I think that in the future, he will be a great head coach. I think that right now he is head coach material. I wouldn't be shocked if after this season, he's hired away and Michigan has to go on an offensive coordinator search, whether that means they promote from within or they hire outside. Who knows? But I really like Sharon Moore. I really admire him, and I think he did a great job against Penn State and a good job against Bowling Green earlier this season. But Harbaugh, to not only Franklin's credit in that him losing to Sharon Moore perhaps isn't as humiliating as I joked it to be or as others made it out to be, Harbaugh is still game planning throughout the week, and Sharon Moore calls the plays on offense, and Jesse Minner calls the plays on defense. Jim Harbaugh isn't calling plays offensively or defensively. He's never called plays defensively at Michigan. He had his hand in the offense really up until whether it was last season or this season. He's had his hand in the offense quite a few times, but this is one of the most independent staffs and independent teams that Harbaugh has presided over. And 2021 and 2022 would be next to this team. It's part of the reason why Harbaugh has been successful. He has been hired, he has hired coaches who he can trust. And he has put more trust and more responsibility on his players. And they have answered. And I think that Sharon Moore against Penn State proved that he knows what matchups go in Michigan's favor. He knows how to identify things that don't go Michigan's way. He knows how to make changes. He knows how to pivot and make a 90-degree turn or a complete 180 or make a 360 and come around with two pistols and fire them right into your program. I think that, and I've said this when Jim Harbaugh was suspended before the Penn State game, Michigan, it is not an excuse if they lose to Maryland or Ohio State or if Harbaugh is somehow suspended beyond that. It's not an excuse for Michigan to lose if Jim Harbaugh isn't on the sidelines because he can still game plan during the week. He can watch film. He can give analysis. He can conjure up a game plan. Sharon Moore has to just manage the team, execute that game plan, and pivot and adapt. And, And that's a lot. I think that if Harbaugh leaves after this season... I'm typically not for internal promotions or internal hires. I think that's how you end up where Dabo Swinney and Clemson are, where they are rotting away. I would trust Sharon Moore to lead this program as a CEO. That takes a rare type of man, and Michigan's very fortunate to have that type of man as their offensive coordinator. But it is beneficial to Sharon Moore that he isn't having to function as the head coach for seven days of the week. He's only having to function as the head coach for one day of the week, that being Saturday. So Harbaugh's suspension, for those of you who read more than just the headlines, we know that he's still game planning and he is still managing the team and being the CEO for six out of seven days during the week. So I think that for Michigan, 
the play you're going to get out of them against Maryland or Ohio State, that is their play, really, with or without Jim Harbaugh. And maybe you want to dive into hypotheticals and say that Michigan with Harbaugh on the sidelines would have won by another touchdown against Penn State. I'd argue that probably on another day, Michigan beats Penn State by double digits in general, but that's hypotheticals. Michigan beat Penn State, and they won their first three games of the season. They're 4-0 and without Jim Harbaugh on the sidelines. And that just goes to show not only that Michigan's schedule has been easier early in the season, but in their game against Penn State, that shows that the Michigan Wolverines have a great staff, an elite staff, that trusts their players, many of whom are future their future men who will play on Sundays in the NFL. Maryland has home field advantage in this matchup. The game will be played in SECU Stadium. The Terrapins are 6-4, and 38th in football power. Michigan is 10-0, and and they are first in football power, surpassing the number one, or previously number one, Ohio State Buckeyes, who were number one in football power, I think, for every week until this week in the 2023 college football season. Ohio State had slowly been falling down in football power, but maintained that number one spot because I think college football this season has been weaker than I and many others anticipated it would be. Meanwhile, Michigan has been one of these teams, along with Penn State and also Oklahoma, that have steadily risen throughout the year in football power. Michigan claiming that number one spot. This late into the season, football power index is scarily accurate at predicting games. Now, I'm not saying that means Michigan will win at all. Right now, they're favored to by football power. Again, they haven't been tested a ton, but they did get a big test, and they passed with flying colors, and they're the number one team in ESPN's efficiency via ESPN Analytics by a mile, with the second most efficient offense and, by a large chunk, the most efficient defense nationally. Michigan is an elite team, and right now this team in particular is a powerhouse. Without their head coach... Vegas is taking that into account, believe me, if Harbaugh on Friday, it's announced that he can and will coach against Maryland and OSU, the spreads for those games will change. In Michigan, as I will discuss in a video tomorrow, doing an early preview for the game, Michigan versus Ohio State, they're favored by closer to a touchdown than a field goal against the Buckeyes, and we don't exactly know whether Jim Harbaugh will be on the sidelines. So, this Michigan team's a powerhouse. They're favored by 19 points on the road. Maryland is home field advantage. They're given a 90.8% chance to win. The Wolverines are, according to ESPN's football power index, subtracting Maryland's value from Michigan's and subtracting a further three points from Michigan due to Maryland's home field advantage because, on average, college football home field advantage is about three points. Michigan should be favored by about 18 and a half. 84% of you, about 2,020 people on my community poll, picked Michigan to win this game. 16% are pulling for the upset, about 380 of you. Remember to vote on my community polls, where the simple question that I ask is, is Team A or Team B going to win this game on Saturday? It's often in fancier words than that. The question, I'm paraphrasing here, that I asked for the Michigan-Maryland post was, will the Wolverines keep their undefeated season alive, something of that sort, or will they look over Maryland and could Maryland pull off an upset? And Maryland can. Maryland has the offense to be competitive and maybe score some points against a Michigan defense that may be coming off of an emotional high. A Michigan defense that didn't have their greatest game of the season against what is a lethargic Penn State offense. But you never know. That's the beauty of college football, is you never know. But Maryland is a large underdog. They are. And Michigan is a powerhouse on both sides of the football. The Terrapins have struggled in the trenches this season. Their offensive line in their four losses was absolutely horrific. And Talia Tagovailoa is still turnover prone. He has thrown eight interceptions on the season against Penn State, Northwestern, Illinois, and Ohio State. 
the Terrapins gave up 17 sacks in four games. In four games, they gave up over four sacks per game on average. But in their six wins, Maryland only gave up four sacks. One sack to Nebraska, one to Charlotte, one to Virginia, one to Indiana. So a key for Maryland is protecting Talia Tagovailoa and providing serviceable pass protection and Talia Tagovailoa not turning the football over, accurately delivering the football to Corey Dicious, to Jay Sean Jones, to his wide receiver core. And if the offensive line functions well, maybe Maryland can have a balanced attack and try and run the ball on Michigan, though that didn't work out so well against Penn State. And Maryland defensively, try and force Michigan to be one-dimensional. Last year, Corum had to carry the ball for close to 40 times for Michigan to eventually pull away against Maryland at home. And in 2021, Maryland was able to successfully limit Michigan's ground game despite not having a great defense, instead having a poor defense themselves that season. So Maryland last year competed with Michigan, In 2021, Michigan dominated them. Of course, past scores aren't an indication of everything all the time. What matters is how good the teams are right now, in the here and now. Other factors like injuries, fatigue by playing a very tough schedule, maybe too much relaxation is in the locker room or in the body language of these players or in their muscles due to not being tested enough. Who knows? But Michigan's a heavy favorite here, and I got to think that Michigan is one of the better teams in the country right now. I have them at number one, and I have them in a special tier with the Oregon Ducks, where I think those are the two best teams in all of college football. Maryland, early in the season, especially after that competitive game against Ohio State, if they can muster that same kind of energy and strategic game plan that they had going into Columbus. They could make this a game. They could straight up win here. And they have some momentum after going on the road and beating Nebraska. Maryland at the beginning of the season looked like a legitimate team. They looked like that they were maybe going to prove me wrong because in the preseason, I thought that Maryland was going to take a step back because of all the production that they were losing especially at wide receiver, and especially on the defense overall, and particularly at secondary. But they were standing at 5-1. and one. They competed with Ohio State and traded blows with them and exchanged leads for three quarters. And then they collapsed against Illinois, collapsed against Northwestern, and Penn State just absolutely took them to the woodshed. And James Franklin broke a 2 by 4 over that program, along with Manny Diaz and his special blitz packages where they had six sacks in that game, which is just monstrous and also forced Maryland to have negative 51 rushing yards. So this is really a tale of two different teams. Not that Maryland is 0-10 and and Michigan is 10-0, but Michigan is at a completely different level than Maryland. I think that we all know this. I think that Michigan beats Maryland at just about every position imaginable. And... I look at the Terrapins and the Wolverines, and I think that even ESPN's FPI in Vegas are underselling, not not what the result will be, because the results can't be determined until the game is played, but I think Michigan should be an even bigger favorite than just under three touchdowns. And that's a pretty big point spread. That's a sizable point spread being on the road, being in a trap game spot. I think all that's factored in. But these are totally different teams. Jim Harbaugh, Sharon Moore, I'm going to put him up here too because he managed a great game against Penn State. This staff and the head CEO, whether it's Sharon Moore or Jim Harbaugh, great game managers. Mike Loxley couldn't be more the opposite. Has not won a big game. His only ranked win at Maryland, his only ranked win came against Syracuse in 2019 only ranked win this year virginia wasn't ranked charlotte wasn't ranked Towson obviously wasn't ranked he had a chance to knock off ohio state and earn another top 25 or in that case it would have been a top five win on the road nearly did it but 
some bad decisions by Talia Tagovailoa, bad game plan, and just a late collapse, largely because of depth, brought that team down. And Michigan has the better defensive staff, the better DC, the better OC. Michigan has better assistance than Maryland does. And they also have more resources, and they're a better football program. Maryland has consistently been one of the bottom feeders in the Big Ten until Mike Loxley, to his credit, brought them to being a serviceable program that can beat up on weaker teams, that can compete with teams in the middle, teams in the upper class of the Big Ten. They have struggled to get any sort of win against the upper class or the elites of the Big Ten. But last season, they competed with Michigan in their house, and they competed with Ohio State at home last year. They competed with Ohio State for three quarters this season. They will have to see what they do against Michigan this Saturday. For the past two seasons, though, Penn State has had their number, although I think that's because Penn State is just sick of Maryland calling it a rivalry when the game obviously isn't a rivalry. Both sides have to view the game as a rivalry for it to be that way. Like Michigan, Michigan State, or Michigan, Ohio State, or Nebraska, Iowa, or Wisconsin, Minnesota. And it has to be competitive, or at least it had to be competitive at some point in history. So you can brew that mutual hatred and animosity towards losing to that team or that fan base. Maryland has never consistently beaten or competed with Penn State enough to form that mutual animosity. But to get back to the roster... Both teams have a good quarterback. Both teams have good running backs. Both teams have good wide receivers, good tight ends. I think the real separation between these schools and these football teams is the defense and the offensive line. I think that there's an argument that Maryland could have the better receiver room. That Maryland, dare I say it, with Corey Deitches and how good of a tight end he is, maybe they have the better individual tight end or better tight end room. Outside of that, I think Michigan washes Maryland away in the position-by-position comparison, and defensively, it's not particularly close. You look at Maryland on the season, 28 sacks, 13 interceptions, that's actually impressive. 27 passes defended, and 5, you heard that right, 5 forced fumbles. Now, on the season... They've also had some dysfunction defensively because they're allowing 22.4 points per game, which is the 47th best scoring defense nationally. The Michigan Wolverines on defense, they've had 23 sacks, 36 passes defended, 12 interceptions, 4 returned for 6, and they have had 8 forced fumbles. Michigan's defense is a lot like Ohio State's. It's very conservative. They, they're successful at getting pressure, but they rarely send more than four or five or, on the rare instance, six men home to try and sack the quarterback. They're more interested in getting coverage sacks, in tackling you right at the line of scrimmage, or maybe allowing a one- or two-yard gain instead of sacking you one play and then allowing you to convert a long first down, like, let's say, Manny Diaz's defense or some of the Pete Golding defenses, defenses that were statistically impressive, but if you watch them play, perhaps they were overinflated due to their aggressiveness. Michigan and Ohio State have very conservative defenses, where they're not flashy if you just look at the box score, but you watch those defenses work, and you're like, holy cow, these are NFL defenses right here. It's not close. Michigan's leading tackler, Junior Colson, he has 52 total tackles, all Big Ten, All-American type linebacker. Michigan's leader in sacks is Josiah Stewart, tied with Jalen Harrell, both with four and a half sacks. Harrell also has two forced fumbles. Stewart and Harrell also have 24 total tackles. They have both broken out this season. Derek Moore has had three sacks, one pass defended, and a forced fumble. And in the defensive back room, Mikey Sainer still has three interceptions. Keon Sab and Will Johnson have two interceptions. Quinton Johnson has one interception, and Rod Moore, Jaden McBurrows, and then on the defensive line, Chris Jenkins and Kenneth Grant also have one interception. So whether it's the secondary, whether it's the pass rush, whether it's the run stop, Michigan is top five in um they're, they're top five in average yards per play allowed, I believe. I know they're a top five scoring defense. 
They're number one in scoring defense. They're only allowing 7.5 points per game while scoring 39 points per game. They're tied for 10th in scoring offense. They're number one in scoring defense. This is a great team that Maryland is going to be facing. A great defense, great offense. And speaking of offense, Talia Tagovailoa leads the Terrapins in passing with 2,769 passing yards. He has 22 passing touchdowns, 8 interceptions. He's averaging 7.4 yards per pass attempt. J.J. McCarthy leads Michigan in passing yards with 2,194. He is averaging 10.3 passing yards per attempt. He has 18 passing touchdowns, 3 interceptions, and a 187.2 passer rating. McCarthy on the season is number two in quarterback efficiency rating with a 92.7 QBR. Talia Tagovailoa has a 72.4 QBR, which is 26th in quarterback efficiency. On the ground, Maryland has rushed for 1,155 yards and 13 touchdowns. Michigan has rushed for 1,731 yards with 28 rushing touchdowns. Michigan's averaging 4.6 yards per carry on the ground. Maryland is averaging 4 yards per carry on the ground. Led by Roman Hemby with 515 rushing yards and 4 rushing touchdowns. Michigan's Blake Corum is 18 rushing touchdowns. You bet that he's going to add at least one, two, or three more against Maryland, and he has 794 rushing yards, averaging 5.2 yards per carry. I'm telling you, these are two of the better Big Ten offenses. Maryland's offense, Michigan, I'd say, is at one. Ohio State's at two. I'd say Maryland's offense is at three. Maryland's problem is their defense can't stop they're like a they're a paper mache bomb shelter or they're a beaver dam with no mud to hold any of the sticks together the defense is it it is closer to garbage than not if maryland had iowa's defense for example they'd probably be scoring close to 40 points per game the problem is all the pressure is on their offense consistently and they don't have an elite offense they have a good to great offense that unfortunately is held back by their defense and their defense can't keep opposing offenses from keeping Maryland's offense off the field funny how that works wide receiver and tight end the receiving game is where both of these teams are most similar Michigan's leading receiver Roman Wilson did not record a single reception against Penn State as Keelan King and Johnny Dixon locked him up but it didn't matter Michigan doesn't need to pass to score on you nor do they need to run on you to score on you. Like we've seen several times this season where maybe Michigan's rushing attack's a little lethargic. McCarthy and his receivers, they open up the playbook and they score. And whether it's A.J. Barner, who has 204 yards and one receiving touchdown, whether it's Colston Loveland, who has 426 receiving yards and four receiving touchdowns, or Roman Wilson himself, number one, with 10 receiving touchdowns, 589 receiving yards, averaging 16.4 yards per reception. And there's also Samaj Morgan, Cornelius Johnson, and Donovan Edwards, and Tyler Morris, who all have over 100 receiving yards, and all but Tyler Morris and Donovan Edwards at least have one receiving touchdown. Morgan has two. Cornelius Johnson has one. Michigan has a stable set of good receivers. This is Michigan's best wide receiver room since Nico Collins and Donovan Peoples-Jones in 2019. The upside here, the speed, the length, the physicality, it's great. Michigan finally has weapons, and they have speed, and they have physicality. They have everything except the X-Factor unicorn in a receiver room. They don't have a Marvin Harrison Jr., they don't have an Emeka Igbuka nor do they have a Brock Bowers at tight end, but they have great to near elite players and several of them at those positions. They just don't have that elite game breaker. Maryland is pretty similar. Jay Sean Jones, Caden Prather, and Ty Felton have over 500 receiving yards. Felton and Prather have five receiving touchdowns each, and Jay Sean Jones has four. Corey Deitches has 42 receptions, second on the team in that statistic, and 401 receiving yards with one receiving touchdown. Deitches is one of the better tight ends in the nation. And Preston Howard, 
the backup tight end, and Roman Hemby and Octavian Smith, those three have over 100 receiving yards. So both of these teams in the tight end position and the wide receiver position, they don't have a game breaker, but they have key contributors and guys who can assist their team to victory rather than holding them back. Michigan in 2021 and last year didn't have much consistency at either quarterback or receiver. This year, they're much more consistent. They could have passed against Penn State and won, but their win wouldn't have been as secure due to some issues at tackle, which I documented earlier today very briefly in my top 10 video, where Michigan's lone weakness this year, I think, is offensive tackle in pass protection. In run block, I don't see a lot of weaknesses, or at least I didn't against Penn State. And everywhere else, you'd have to nitpick to find weaknesses. Offensive tackle is a legitimate issue for the Michigan Wolverines, but overall, they've only allowed 22... No, that's Maryland. Maryland's allowed 22 sacks on the year. Michigan's only allowed 12 to J.J. McCarthy so far. They're still one of the better pass block offensive lines nationally. Penn State just has that good of a pass rush. They have close to 40 sacks on the season. They, in fact, might have 40 sacks because they gained one against Michigan, and I think that they had 39 before their matchup with the Wolverines at home. My players to watch in this game are J.J. McCarthy for Michigan and Kellen Wyatt for Maryland. Kellen Wyatt for Maryland. I want to start with him because he's the more intriguing player to watch. I've had J.J. McCarthy as a player to watch in multiple Michigan games. I picked Kellen Wyatt because he's fourth on the team in total tackles with 33. He has a fumble recovery. More importantly, he has four and a half sacks. Now, I expect Michigan is going to throw the football more against Maryland. They could against Maryland. Maryland is a weaker defense than Penn State. Michigan could literally run the Wildcat and probably win this game, or at least have a good chance of winning this game and, and controlling it with how their run game looked against Penn State and how Maryland's defense has looked overall. Kellen Wyatt is a sophomore, 6'3", 262 pounds. His best game this season was against... It was really tied for Ohio State, Illinois, Nebraska, and he recorded a season high of seven total tackles against Penn State. Against Nebraska, Illinois, and Ohio State, he had four total tackles each in those games and also one sack in each of those games. Against Nebraska, though, he did have a fumble recovery, so I'd say he's riding off of momentum from a great performance last week against the Cornhuskers. The Maryland Terrapins, they have 28 sacks on the season. They have capability of getting to the quarterback and also of forcing interceptions. They need to do that against J.J. McCarthy. I don't think that Maryland is going to stop Miss Michigan's rushing attack or force fumbles or stuff their ground game. Maryland's best opportunity to win, I think, is trying to bait Michigan in the passing game and get pressure Get Michigan to waste some downs and waste some drives trying to pass the ball and play more balanced because I expect that they will, especially since they want to be able to be used to throwing the ball and catching the ball and developing pass concepts and pass plays because Ohio State's defense, while it may not be better than Penn State's, I think Ohio State's defense requires a balanced attack to beat it especially since Ohio State can score points on their offense alone, not requiring their defense or special teams to put their offense in good field position, like Penn State's offense. So that's that's Maryland's game plan, I think, is shut down Michigan's passing attack and try and exploit some big plays through the air. A player to look out for offensively for Maryland, I would say, is Jayshon Jones, Ty Felton, Corey Deitches can probably have some matchup advantages in this game. Roman Hemby in that Maryland run game, I do not trust against who I think has the number one defensive line in the country, being Michigan. For the Wolverines, J.J. McCarthy is my player to watch. How is he going to perform after he had to do a lot against Penn State? He had to have clean handoffs. He had to be a run threat. He functionally executed the read option against Penn State a few times, and he had that direct quarterback run snap to to his right side to pick up a first down on third and 10. He had to do a lot 
but not in the passing game against Penn State. He had to do a lot in terms of clean handoffs, of checking plays with Sharon Moore and adjusting plays at the line of scrimmage. He had to do a fair amount more than the box score would indicate. But with his arm, I'm curious to see how after really having a half off outside of one pass attempt, how his arm will come out immediately out of the gate in this game. If Michigan will even throw against Maryland, maybe J.J. McCarthy is this amazingly long scramble, which would be a, a Heisman moment if not for the fact that he only passed for 60 yards against Penn State. Who knows? Really, who knows? But he has maturity. He's grown this season. He's second in the nation in quarterback efficiency, only behind Jaden Daniels, who I think is college football's best player right now. Reminds me a lot of Lamar Jackson at Louisville, of Kyler Murray at Oklahoma with what he's doing on the ground and through the air with Mike Denbrock and Brian Kelly's LSU offense. McCarthy is an elite quarterback, and I think I can say that after watching him against Penn State, not mess up. Was he asked to do much through the air? No, but he was asked to run the football. He executed read options well. He blocked decently. And when he made throws, he made sure to put them on the money. And for the lone pass attempt that he had in the second half against Penn State, that was an accurate bullet to A.J. Barner. That's why the P.I. was called on Kalen King. If King didn't interfere with Barner, that was going to be an explosive passing play for Michigan, and Penn State just couldn't afford that. So those are my players to watch for Michigan. We could also look out for Blake Corum. I think it's highly expected that he will break 20 rushing touchdowns on the season, definitely break 800 rushing yards. Donovan Edwards could be another player. We could see him matched up against Maryland secondary as a receiver, or maybe we could see him break off a big run against a vulnerable defense. Regardless, I think Michigan wins this game. I'm going to go with 49-7. to Typically, I would add some extra points, but I think Michigan is going to get plenty of touchdowns rather quickly, and then they're going to cool it off in the second half to rest and prepare for their matchup against the Ohio State Buckeyes. J.J. McCarthy will throw for 250 or more yards and two or more touchdowns, and the offense will thrive. I expect Blake Corum to get two or three rushing touchdowns, so he'll cross 20 rushing touchdowns. The defense will earn three sacks to cross 30 sacks, or not 30 sacks, 25 sacks, rather, on the season. I forgot that they were at 23 and not higher than that. And I think they will force multiple turnovers. Some of them will be later in the game, though. I don't think that Michigan will cash in necessarily on all of those turnovers. I think Michigan will come out again fast, probably score 28, 35 points by halftime. Maryland probably won't score their seven until later in the game. And then Michigan will have their second stringers, third stringers, and walk-ons on for part of the third quarter and definitely, I think, for all of the fourth quarter. Maryland can win. I'm not saying Maryland can't win, and I have not said that all video. I just think that this Michigan team is focused. They're mad. I don't expect there to be any drop-off in performance. If anything, Michigan's performance against Penn State, and we'll see whether I'm right in this, this thought process when Michigan plays Ohio State, I think they could do better than they did on the road against the Nittany Lions. But I think part of that was due to the fact that they were without Jim Harbaugh. There were some emotions there. It mainly went to their benefit. It also, I think, might have worked against them in some instances, especially in the first quarter when they looked a little lost. I think that Michigan can do better and will do better than they did against Penn State, and that starts this weekend. The Terps will be aggressive, too. I think they'll go for it often on fourth down. I don't think they'll kick plenty of field goals unless they're in a fourth and long or fourth and so long that we can't convert even with a long touchdown pass or long passing play that you will rarely see them kick field goals. They'll gain several empty yards especially later in the game, and come up empty because of their aggression and desire to score touchdowns, not kick field goals and capitulate. And this will be through the air and the ground. I wouldn't be shocked if the box score yardage is pretty close, but the score is this lopsided because later in the game, I think Maryland will be able to drive on second, third, and fourth stringers and walk-ons for Michigan. 
Maryland will be humiliated at home by the Michigan Wolverines, and Michigan will move on to 11-0 to once again meet up with Ohio State in a game where as long as Ohio State beats Minnesota will be another 11-0 versus 11-0 matchup. And if Georgia loses to Tennessee, which I think Georgia wins and probably covers that 10.5 point spread, but if Tennessee somehow wins, Michigan versus Ohio State will be number one versus number two, and it will be a game of the century. Thank you all so much for watching this video. Remember to like, subscribe, and click the notification bell so that you can get notified when I post more college football content. Thanks to Crash2488, Anthony McDowell, and Justin Rogg for being Heisman Patreon members. Thanks to Spencer Bringhurst, Noah DDLC, and SFS Inverted for being All-American patrons. And thanks to Will Loftus, Gabriel Callender, Roaming Gnome, Matthew Sale, Chris Lane, Austin Christmas, and Zubin Za for being All-Conference patron members. Have a great day, guys, and I will see you around. Bye-bye.